All right, welcome uh, to the uh, two, to August 17th, 2022 meeting of the Northampton Urban Forestry Commission. Um, meetings being recorded. Uh, we have one member of the public, Jackie. I don't know if you want to make a public comment at all. You're just here to listen and please ask questions uh, at any time if you'd like. Um, for uh, Molly and Sue, you see Deb. And... Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Did anyone who's, ever... who's with Deb? I'm sorry. I'm... Bonnie. I'm Bonnie. sorry. Bonnie. This is Bonnie uh, Netto. She's going to be yep. doing the meetings from now on. Oh, okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah. But Bonnie is a clerk, a uh, new clerk in our office. So do, did anyone have a chance to review the minutes that I sent out earlier this morning? I did yep. not. Okay, well, they're in your inbox, so take your time. Got them. All right. Let's see. Okay. Okay, I'm done. I'm good. All right. Any uh, changes or corrections? If not, could I have a motion to accept the minutes of the July 20th, 2022 meeting? Oh, Sue. Yeah. I will make a motion to accept the meeting minutes from July 22, 2022. Okay, may I have a second, please? A second. All right, we have a second. Any discussion on the floor? No discussion. Uh, Devin, Bonnie, <laughs> could you guys do a roll call vote, please? Gladly. Rich? Yes. Jen? Yes. Molly. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Susan. Go ahead, Susan. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, a couple of things uh, that I want to bring you up to speed on. So the uh, public shade tree hearing that I talked about at our last meeting for River Road has actually been scheduled. It's the 25th of August at 2.30 p.m. Uh, at 222 River Road which is the high, uh, the foot of the high view um, long-term care facility. Um, there are six trees that need to be removed that are growing out of the large rock wall um, on the way toward, on, on that abuts that property along uh, the road, on River Road towards, going towards Williamsburg. Um, the total mitigation that National Grid is gonna have to pay for the removal is, um, for the loss of the trees is $3,950. So that will uh, afford, um, that'll actually go into our tree fund um, and that will also allow National Grid to set new poles along River Road 
so they can actually upgrade the utility that runs through the woods that feeds um, Haydenville and Williamsburg. So I will let you know at our next meeting what the results were of that hearing. Um, I had a conversation, an email conversation and, and an in-person conversation with Alex Sherman. He's the tree warden for the city of Springfield. So I was trying to get him to come to one of our meetings. I was trying to get him to come to this one to talk about um, Springfield's response uh, to spotted lanternfly. Mm -hmm. But he was not able to come to this one, but he's willing to come to another one at mm -hmm. some point. So I will pencil him in maybe as a guest speaker at our next meeting. Because yeah. I'm just curious um, to see what his Springfield's response, but also what the state response or what kind of state assistance. And we can talk more about this. Sorry, who did you say? Alex Sherman from Springfield. He's the tree warden. Oh, oh, right, right. Yep. He's a great guy. I've worked with him when I uh, yep. worked down at Stick. He's he's a really great guy. Yeah, we also had um, people from the um, Forest Health Program speak one time about Asian long hair beetles for Tree Northampton. I don't know if there's somebody from there if Alex is too busy. Yeah, I could get, I could actually ask uh, Nicole Kelleher if she would be interested. She, she took over for Ken Gooch. He's oh, the, wow. Yeah, so she, she might um, come and give a little presentation. So I'm trying to line up a few speakers, um, but I thought given that Spotted Lantern Plan is like right down in the valley now, it'd be good to hear from Alex. Yes, Molly. Do you know if Holyoke has a tree warden? They do, they do have a tree warden. I'm but, thinking we could invite that person as well because okay. it's all connected. All right, I'll make a note of that. Okay. Um, and that's really all I have. I have some other things to talk about, but it can come under the SDO or I can, unless anyone has any questions, I can run, roll right into the SDO. Could we invite Amherst too, if we pin down a speaker? Um, Amherst, the tree warden or the Amherst tree committee? The tree committee there, if they wanted to listen in, if we were having a speaker about spotted lanternfly, they might be, you know what I mean? Just yep. so if we're getting somebody who's knowledgeable. Okay. Um, I'd be happy to help. All right, I will, let me, court. I'll try to coordinate that with you outside of a meeting so we can figure out if we can find a time that works for everyone. Okay. Um, all right, the STO. So since our last meeting, I have I met twice with Carolyn Mish. Uh, I met with her on the 25th of July and the 2nd of August and uh, went through our the draft that uh, our final draft that we sent back in, I think the beginning, the last June, where I actually was in June that I finally was able to get Carolyn to commit to some dates because Wayne is retiring. Now that Carolyn is the Director of Planning and Sustainability, um, she's worked with me twice on this. So I, I don't have a, a, um, a draft to share with you. I, I, do, I can tell you just a couple of things that Carolyn um, it was uh, very amenable to the changes that we made. Um, the one change that uh, Carolyn probably will come back with a little bit of a change is um, that you are, I don't have it in front of me, but like the URB districts, which are like the central business district, Florence Center, Leeds, those places, instead of being at 12 inches, I think they're gonna ask for 15 inches uh, as the threshold, um, but all the other um, different zoning districts stayed, remain the same with the, the rule being the smallest at, at six inches. Um, I also think that uh, Carolyn was looking to, was, you know, this is something that we were trying to figure out if we could actually add some language um, similar to the, to the um, net zero, net zero issues that are in there that allow people a waiver. We, Carolyn was asking about creating a waiver for uh, folks that are gonna build fossil fuel free dwellings. But the issue, one of the issues Carolyn was trying to figure out is that the climate bill, I think that uh, Governor Baker just signed into law actually has a caveat in there for fossil fuel building construction going forward. 
So that might make that a moot point in this document. But Carolyn was interested in tying that into a um, um, into the city's goal for you know to reduce its carbon footprint by requiring all new construction that's under a special permit or site plan review to be fossil fuel free. And if it was, then they would be granted a waiver. However, they'd be required to plant a certain amount of trees on the frontage of the building that would be uh, abutting the public right of way or the sidewalks, et cetera. So um, that might be uh, another draft piece that's coming from, from their office as well. So I, I have a quick question about that. Sure. So um, let's say, you know, they're for a site plan review and they say, yes, let's say this all goes through and gets changed to say they can they have an exemption to cut down trees and then they have to plant new ones in the front. Is the, during that site plan review, is there any, like I can see what will happen is an architect or a landscape architect or, you know, they'll have a building and then they'll have a three, three foot wide little thing to put trees in, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, I don't know, I don't know where, I don't know where to check on that. You know, because the general public has seen tree pits for so long that that's like a normal thing. And they don't understand that that's actually not a sustainable, that tree is never gonna grow to be really big, right. you know? So, you know, I don't know if there is an exemption, like I would just like to see wherever it needs to be written in that there's some specifications that you know, each tree has to have, you know, X amount of soil volume available for the species. Do you know what I'm saying? Nope. Like, like the Cornell, you know, Nina Bassick's little simple formula, you know, how much volume does a tree need? You know, so, so if it's a mature tree tops out at, you know, let's say 15 inches, then it's so much per, DBH, you know, because I, so maybe a developer would have to bump their building back three feet or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was I wondering just, the same thing because yeah. you see these new buildings going in with no space in the front. Right. Yeah, that's part of our zoning, part of our zoning code though is, um, especially like on King Street, it's a good example, like the Starbucks, the building is in the front of the part of, and the, all the parking is in the rear. Although there is plenty of planting plant place in front of that building for plant material, never mind the fact that it's it's dead though because of the drought um, and because of the winter. Um, I, this it's a good question. I think what we would end up doing is that the the our tree every the tree list and planting guidelines it would be the recommended document that the applicant would or their landscape architect would use the applicant's landscape architect would use. So we probably um because we do talk about um you know the planting tree selection and tree planting shall be mirrored of, of the tree list and planting guidelines we could actually add uh language in there that talks about the appropriate soil volume because there isn't you know the appropriate soil volume we could do a page like a, a like a, yeah. a page saying yes this is how you figure out how much that that's that's a good idea. Jackie, you're yes, Jackie. Um, yes, I think that Jen has a good idea. Jen makes a very good point based on what I've seen on in development on my own street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Molly, you had your you were raising your hand. Yeah, this is probably really impractical, but just you know, I'm thinking, oh, we're gonna replace a tree, which is actually taking carbon out of the atmosphere. And we're going to put in a net zero house. Well, okay, that's good, but we're still losing out because the tree was actually removing CO2 from the air. I wonder if there's any way to, um, like, if they leave a tree of a certain size, they wouldn't have to do net zero. They could, like, you know, get a credit for the tree they leave as a way of, you know, balancing out their fossil fuel use. It's probably too complicated to make a formula for that, though. Um, no, you probably could actually use um, iTree 
I mean, uh, the, the similar, uh, similar, um, my thought goes to storm, the stormwater mitigation piece of all this construction is something that is very overlooked. And we, we follow, um, you know, there's the stormwater regulations that we follow that the state requires a developer to meet criteria, but there's nothing factored into that stormwater calculation that has to do with, uh, you know, water uptake from trees. So th there's, so, right. you know, an, another way to do it would be that a developer would have uh, another caveat, you would be able to, um, you would get a credit, for an example, as, as an applicant would get credit for keeping so many trees on their property because they would be pouring less water into the city stormwater system. Yeah. You know, right. it's very, but it's, again, it's very complicated and there's no, that's not factored into the formula, which drives, it's, I don't understand that, but, um, but it, it's similar. Is the formula by which um, Carolyn's being evaluated in terms of, or, you know, and the city's being evaluated in terms of benchmarks for sustainability and mm -hmm. carbon, is it just like not factoring in this stuff at all? Like the, the, the way that they're evaluating the progress like we can be in this meeting and say, oh, they should be able to factor in a, all the carbon that leaving a tree there provides. But I'm I'm concerned that the way they evaluate the progress doesn't have any sense of where trees fit in. No. I I actually think there's it's probably very complicated. As much as I think these are all great in the stormwater one as well, it's very complicated. Yeah. Um, and I don't really know what the right answer is. I mean, I, we, we have the existing ordinance and we're, you know, I, again, I don't know if the fossil fuel part of it's actually going to be necessary now that the governor has passed that, you know, signed the climate bill, uh, creating very stringent, new stringent building codes and requiring fossil fuel free construction. But um, it would be interesting because I think it's one of the tools in the toolbox that gets the city to the, its, um, you know, to its net zero goal of 2050. It's a combination platter. It's a combination of tree plantings. It's a combination of, uh, you know, getting people off the grid. It's a combination of net zero construction, fossil fuel free construction, getting people out of cars and on their feet or on bikes or walking distance. So. You know, the Climate Resiliency Regeneration Plan kind of guides all of this, um, and the building code is always evolving. So the building code is also something that to take into account that I'm not an expert at all, but the, the more the, the building code gets more complicated as um, people are required to do fossil fuel free construction. So um, I, I don't know, I, I want to wait until I get a draft from Carolyn and I, I have a couple of things I need to adjust in there. So we're gonna merge both of our drafts together and probably have one more meeting and make sure everything is where we both think it should be. And then we'll bring it back to the commission. So probably in September is my goal, so. Yeah, cause I just, I just would like to see somebody or uh, something besides just the landscape architect gets to okay what's going on because I've worked long enough. To, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I've worked long enough in this industry to see, you know, just a ton of municipal plantings that win awards and look great for a year and then everything's dead like three years later. Mm -hmm. you know? And and um, you know they do what they do well, but um like horticultural uh, plant material growth stuff. It's just not part of their um, training very much, so. No, it's not. And the other problem is maintenance. Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly. There's, there's lots of money available to, to, construct, yep. to construct things yep. and make them look wonderful. And um, then you walk away. And I mean, even, even, my, even the DPW uh, in the city, I should say, is you see that everywhere. I mean, yeah, you see, there's yeah, we, we can't like pass. Yep, we mm -hmm. can't maintain what we what we've constructed, unfortunately. Yeah. So. Yeah. Some of the trees on King Street are already dead. 
Yep. Yeah. Well, they're not getting water. And yep. they underplant them. Like this underplanting stuff in oh, a yeah. in a high traffic municipal setting, I, I it just makes me nuts. In the middle of the summer, they planted yeah. those expensive yeah. trees. Yep. Yep. Didn't water them. Yep. Well, they 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 have watered them. I've seen them water them, but they're not watering them frequently enough. And those trees are exposed to complete sunlight. So but the, they're, they're the contractor's responsibility. So the city will not accept the dead plant material. So that project has not is not completed. So and it has not been turned over to the city. So that's uh whole sorry, nother. I got a little snippy. No, okay. <laughs> we all have strong feelings about this. Yeah. Sure. I just no, hate I the mean, waste. Yeah, yeah. And we don't have time to lose. Yeah. It's yeah. getting hotter. Yeah. And to do to plant responsibly and to use our tax payer dollars responsibly right just so many reasons why that was right. wrong and the shortage of of big plant material you know i mean there's a shortage of nursery stock so for all the other communities too they can't get exactly it. right like what you put in the ground we need to make every effort to keep it alive you know and it's pretty it's not rocket science you know um, all right. Does anyone have else have any questions? So hopefully I'll have a draft for you um, to review at our next meeting. Um, okay. Uh, fall planting discussion. I was hoping to have Rob. He texted me back and said that he was out looking at trees. He forgot he's coming. Okay. So all right. we so could. We could uh, just shift. Let's, let's just table that for now. If you're okay with that. Um, DCR community challenge grant opportunities, Jen, um, I made you a co-host. I don't know if you want to do a screen share. Yeah, that might be the easiest. Let me see if okay. I can. So do I have to open the document first? Yes. No, I do. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think, yeah, I have it. I have it. Okay. Thanks so much for sending that around. Yeah, yeah. sure. Sure. It's the beauty of, uh, not going back to school <laughs> <laughs> going down it there were like so many cool things that we've already talked about uh, and yeah. then the big one inventory okay can you see that yes yes perfect all right so what i did was i just went on the website and um tried to you know the whole there's a lot of information on that website and i just tried to kind of consolidate it. Um, I printed out all kinds of stuff, but so uh, I'll just briefly go through this. Let me see if I can, hold on, I gotta move this over so I can move the document. Okay, so uh, basically what, oh, before we start, we, ha we did um, get one of these grants for, uh, how was it, 2017 or something, 2016? For, do you remember, Rich? Yeah, it was 2016. We were awarded a grant for our uh, first ever uh, shade tree inventory. Right, and then we actually were awarded another one for planting in a um, in a um, environmental justice zone. And because of COVID, we we couldn't pull that off. So uh, that kind of got uh, moved on. But anyway, so we have experience with this. Um, so basically what it is, is they're matching grants uh, to municipalities or nonprofits, doesn't have to be a municipality, 50-50 um, uh, matching grants. If the project is within environmental justice zone, it's a 75-25 match. And matching funds can be actual local funds, money, or it can be in-kind contributions. And I think it can be a combination of both of those. If I'm correct about that. Um, the initial um, intent to apply form, it's a one pager, um, needs to be received by October 1. And then by November 1, the full grant packet needs to be um, uh, delivered. And, um, and the, from what was on the website, their staff really wants to be meeting with whoever's writing the grant or touching base so they can um, know, you know, help or know what's going on or, you know, 
So the grants are um, from a thousand to forty thousand um, dollars, and then basically there's six general areas and um, one other area. So uh, the main bullet points are building and strengthening citizen ab advocacy and action organizations. So um, there was some way of building Tree Northampton or something like that. Uh, priorities given to new groups. Uh, there is a $10,000 cap for community wood bank, um, which is setting up a way that people can access firewood using local, um, local wood that's been taken down. Uh, developing and adopting tree and forest ordinance policies, uh, ordinances and policies. Um, that's kind of speaks for itself, I guess. Um, there is money for, uh, you can write a grant for securing or training professional staff, uh, although it has to be um, uh, for certifications or courses or hiring a consultant, not uh, for funding a professional staff that is existing or trying to substitute a source of funding for currently funded positions. So you can't like hire a person. Well, unless they're a consultant. Um, I think uh, the next two are um, kind of what Rich was alluding to when uh, last meeting he talked about a, a, a follow-up tree inventory. Uh, there's two to me that are a little bit similar, I guess. But uh, one is developing and implementing a systematic urban forestry uh, management plan, I guess. Uh, so that could include tree inventory and analysis. The tree and inventory has to be tied to some kind of routine maintenance or planting, which I think our last tree, you know, part of the tree inventory was what are empty plant spaces and then uh, the condition of the trees so Rich could develop a pruning schedule or a takedown schedule. Um, it could be resource assessment using tools like uh, canopy analysis, iTree, GIS, LIDAR, those kind of things, survey of planting sites. But it seems like you could do a tree survey that would fold all that in. Um, or What's a canopy analysis? Is that the like taking the number of trees in the different families and seeing if our ratio, where our ratio is, or is it something else? It could be, I think canopy analysis can be, somebody else could speak too for this. I think canopy analysis can be many things. I think it can be used to uh, determine what neighborhoods have the most coverage or could be um, things like, uh, used to analyze um you know heat island effect or mm. where it could affect uh, kind of the physics of the whole thing energy benefits of trees that kind of thing do you, Richard, you. molly do you have any other oh you're muted molly i'm guessing that it has to do with using aerial photos Yes, it can. Yeah. yeah. iTree has a whole suite of tools that you can do things with. <coughs> At one time we were talking about using LIDAR for something and I can't remember what it was for. We were told it was too expensive. It would tell us, um, it would look at our entire canopy and not just the public trees. Oh yeah. yeah tree yeah, inventory yeah. was public trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. And then yeah. basically Carolyn said that's ridiculous really expensive and not something that we could do yeah what about gis what does that exactly mean oh i can tell you gi what is gis you mean yeah it stands for geographic information system and it's a it's a it's a way of doing maps and analyses on the computer you can um a lot of the maps i've showed you have been yeah. gis maps but the thing that's about gis is you can overlay lots of different layers and then you can analyze different ways that they overlap like how many trees are within 20 feet of a fire hydrant or something like that 
Yeah. You know, or, or how many trees are within, you know, 50 feet of a road or, you know, you can I do have a vague idea from you talk, mentioning GIS, GIS and the, and the, and the city uses it for all sorts yeah. of things. But right. So here, thank you. So we overlay different aspects of infrastructure and trees. Yep. Thank you. And then this this topic could also be used to uh, for management plans or street tree master plans or management plans, um, which you know if you somebody wanted to develop a plan for invasive pest mitigation or you know something like that. Like if if we wanted if we found out here's what we need to do for spotted lantern fly, yeah. we could write a grant and you know be able to pay for that. So wow. Um, uh, and, oh, one other thing about this, um, you know, they, they really encourage people not to reinvent the wheel, that there's all kinds of um, inventory structures already made up and management plans you can copy and things like that. So uh, the last kind of topic, uh, except other than other, is uh, completing strategic community tree plantings and heritage tree care projects. So um, uh, to have, which we kind of do these community plantings anyway, like we did one at Jackson Street, we've done one at Cooley Dickinson, you know, I think those are the kind of things that can be funded. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, put the one we did with the Rotary, you know, could have been considered this. Um, Heritage trees are, uh, there's a lot of criteria that they have to meet. Um, they have to be greater than 32 inches DBH and there has to be some cultural or historical significance. Um, so, and there's kind of more information on the website about how to write a grant to, to take care of a heritage tree. A lot of times it's cabling or lightning protection or some big event or something about like that. Yeah. Does it have to have both? It has to be over 32 and cultural and historical significance yes. or one or the other? Yeah, yeah, it has to be both. They have some specific uh, in the document, they have, uh, you know, kind of a bulleted list of things that the tree has to meet in some way. Mm. Um, and then other, uh, they have had other uh, people um, kind of, write grants for a community-wide urban forestry education program, uh, some partnerships between communities to, um, to uh, uh, pool resources to do maintenance between several communities, um, that kind of thing. You know, it's kind of people embedded things. So you, if you do get selected for a grant, it, uh, the project has to be completed within 12 months. And then um, I don't have to go through the criteria, but this is the criteria for the for rating the proposals. And, you know, a lot of it is just a quality grant. And one of them is to be a Tree City USA. We are Tree City USA. Thanks to Rich, you know, applying for that every year. That does make these grants available and other money is available because we're Tree City USA. So um that's kind of in a nutshell so thank you sure Th thank you um <clears throat> jen just to follow up question on something that's not on here did you get my email today regarding the the uh art grant national grid i did okay so so i don't really think uh, I, I don't i think it's it so there is another set of grants that are through National Grid um, that pretty much has the same, same, it's just another pool of money. It has the same topics. It's not really different that I can tell. It's just a, another source of money for the same types of things. But you have to be, uh, ACT community, which I didn't know what that was. So Rich determined that we probably are not. It's how many trees they removed from our town. 
So I don't think that's a deal. I don't, it's not that big of a deal. It's from what I can tell, it's the exact same, almost the exact same document as this, <clears throat> except the money comes from somewhere else. I have another question. Yeah. For the, for the heritage tree, um, does that have to be on public property? Uh, hold on one second. Let me look. Uh, let's see. Give me a second. Uh, let's see. Let me... Heritage tree. Um... I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Oh, hold on. A tree may be a heritage tree because of its association with a historical slash cultural event, person, or time period. Or it may be that the community has identified it as deserving to be heritage recognition and designated as a heritage tree. Your application for a heritage tree care project should include supporting documentation of the cultural and or historical significance of the tree in question. Documentation may include historic photos, text, press releases, other publicity regarding the tree. Mm -hmm. While trees that communities identify as heritage may benefit from increased public awareness being designated, heritage tree does not afford any special legal protection under MGL chapter 87. So it there's nothing about that it has to be a public tree. But I don't know if it would be appropriate for the city to um, use that money to take care of a tree on private land. Yeah, we would. I mean, let's uh, say, well, let's say it was in historic Northampton's yard. Yeah. For example, or a school or some, you know. Well, I'm thinking of that big benefit. I'm thinking of that big elm in front of the Quick Mart. Oh, I think yeah. I don't know. There's you more guys, details we can go into. It's hard to think of like what the historical significance is, though. Well, I think it does have historical significance because on that corner there used to be there's a whole there's a, a historical plaque right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, that has uh, something about I can't remember what it is i read it before. yeah there was a there was an important building there that was sold dismantled and taken to vermont somewhere mm -hmm. an inn or something yeah huh. yep. yeah well if that tree was there at the time that could be maybe that would qualify mm -hmm. anyway so are we going to try to think about um which of those areas we might apply for grant in I'm going to stop sharing, I guess. Yeah. Does that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jen. That was yeah, sure. That's a good refresher because there's so much, uh, there's so much available. There's so many grants available and there are many different ways you can come at them. I mean, yeah. I personally speaking, I would like to, I would, I would like to reach out to Davy resource group just to find out how much it would cost to re-inventory our existing canopy. Now that we already have a data set, and see if it would be something that would be worthwhile uh, to apply to see if we could get a DCR grant to pay for some of it. Um, Do you think they could include in that survey um, open planting sites? Sure, we could. We could. You can write the RFP any way you want. We could include school grounds. You could include um, the bikeway to a certain degree. You could include whatever you like. Do you think we could include um, moving data that we have in Excel into our tree keeper? Yeah, that probably could actually, that probably could be done without needing a grant. Oh. Hi, Rob. Hi, I'm very sorry. I actually forgot. It's okay. I was, I was out, it's all that matters. I was out just looking at trees, just seeing how beautiful they were. Um, so, so. Rich, I have a question. So if there was, what what are you hoping to get out of like our new tree inventory? Like what, what would be the benefit to you or to? Um, the benefit to, to us would be that we'd have fresh data. You know, the tree, a lot of the tree inspections are old. 
Yeah. Um, we have, we, we've, that's one thing. So the existing tree species, the existing trees that are old need to actually be looked at again. And I've been doing it one at a time as I find them or people call me or they fall down or, um, but I think the more importantly, I think what's important is for us to capture the trees that we've planted and actually look at the, the diversity of the canopy overall, because don't forget, we've planted almost 20% of the total uh, inventory of trees in six years time. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've definitely um, changed our, our species. Mm -hmm. um, so originally we were at 35% uh, maple and about 21% of our canopy was oak. Mm -hmm. um, and we've really made a great effort to, to be able to, I don't think, the only place we've planted maples in the last six years is Pulaski Park. And that was probably, they shouldn't have happened. And I don't know why I didn't catch them, but it just didn't, it didn't, uh, I didn't catch it. But, um, and we've really planted very few, we planted a lot of oaks, but mainly in the white, white oak group um not the red oak group mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i mean just having that data just having all the new data i think would be helpful in trying to drive us in a you know the direction we need to go also probably trying to define or refine the available space that is left yeah you know i mean i i think the inventory was helpful identifying the 2000 planting locations but i think for me it they were it was helpful just that here's a location it, it wasn't super helpful because just because it, they said it was a vacant location didn't mean it was exactly the right place to plant a tree or you know we may disagree with the soil volume size so mm -hmm. i think think still having that data that picks on these and, and maybe we expand that to include setback locations. We did not because the last inventory we just talked about um, tree uh, locations that were in the public right of way are on are like on park property, et cetera, but uh, not setback. Although we have collected, we have collected all that data, and the data that we've collected could be easily put into a new inventory because it's all you know GIS format. So. I mean, th those are the kind of things that I'm, um, and the, the, one other thing I just want to point out to you is that 2016 was our first ever inventory. We had a terrible drought. 2022, we are in the same predicament. So we are, we are losing uh, adolescent trees, we're losing young trees, and we're losing mature trees. So the canopy is constantly changing. So having another um baseline i think would be important um but you know i'm also open to applying for other grants too would it bring in data from all the trees that have been removed and it'll also capture deterioration on trees that we can use that we can identify as failing in anticipation of what we'll need to do in the future and ask for funding for? Is that an aspect of um, the value of a tree well, inventory? Yeah, 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 it is because you, you're gonna actually understand the real time. That, that particular snapshot in time when that person goes up to that tree, they're gonna give you a condition rating of the tree and they're gonna give you a risk assessment. And then basically you act upon that uh, based upon what the how, how high the risk is. Um, and the condition of the tree, you know, so you basically prioritize your urban forestry work um, that way. And also, I think it would be, it would probably be helpful too, because I see us moving more towards using um, contractors for removals, but also we have money available this year for a con contractors uh, for a trimming, tree trimming. So, ah, yeah. So that, that's Young another, tree trimming. Yeah. So, I mean, so, you know, we unfortunately we haven't met the metrices of the actual routine uh, pruning cycles for mature trees. You know, we, we've not done well with that. Um, so having money for a contractor to do pruning will hopefully get to some of these trees that are still salvageable 
um, that have, you know, dead wood or they have, um, you know, they're an adolescent tree that has structural issues, but they're not too far gone that they can't be corrected beforehand. That's the kind of stuff I'd be looking for. But I'm also, like I said, I'm interested in if there's other grant opportunities that you'd like to apply for. I'm happy to do that as well. That's just from my urban forester hat perspective. Yes, Jen. I think uh, the other thing about, um, you alluded to this, but I think it can be used for budget planning in mm -hmm. the future because you have an, uh, like an outside professional who is not, doesn't have anything invested in hiring more people or, you know, spending more money or whatever it is, um, or buying a new truck or, you know, whatever it would be um, to meet the, you know, the future needs of the department. And also um, could be pitched as um, a way to prevent power failures. You know, we're going to have increased storms that one of the largest, you know, causes, I would assume, of power failures in a municipality is um, in a storm is tree failures. So a lot of the pruning stuff is going to, um, you know, prevent or mitigate uh, some of the power outages and, um, you know, and it, it's kind of a peripheral thing, but it's... Uh, you know, it, it's a reality. And I think that's why we really were messed up in that October storm back in 2011, I think. Mm -hmm. Along with a lot of communities, the trees were not maintained because that's one of the first places that the, you know, money gets taken away during, you know, budgetary crisis. So, um, and it takes expert people to be able to prune those kinds of trees. So, you know, that some people didn't have power for a week. You know, that's a long, long time not to have power, so. Yeah, I, I, that you bring a really, you raise a really good point because if you remember that in 2016, when we had our first inventory completed, the DPW didn't have an urban forestry budget. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the tree warden. I was also the highway superintendent. Right. We used highway division funds. Um, we had highway division employees doing the maintenance. We had highway division employees planting along with uh, volunteers and members of Tree Northampton. Fast forward 2022, we have now, uh, you know, a um, forestry parks and cemetery division. We actually have a budgeted number um, for uh, the tree, you know, all, all the tree uh, services that we provide from planting to pruning to removals. But we don't, we still, and we have a bona fide budget, but we built it out of like thin air, you know, because mm -hmm. Mary Narkowitz wanted to actually change, um, you know, create a basically an outdoor grounds division or a, um, um, you know, yeah, an outdoor grounds division that managed all the um, growing in the, uh, the live infrastructure that the city has. So I think that would all that what Jen said is really important. It would lend a, a, a real time dollar amount to what it would take to you know get from the from point A to point Z uh, in the city's urban canopy and the health based on the health of the canopy. So as a budgeting tool, I would suggest also that what Jen was saying made me think. You know, there's individuals involved in the management, Rich, you and mayors for whom you serve at their behest and um this is like an outside thing that provides continuity you know i want you to stay tree warden for you know another 20 years but you probably don't want to no comment <laughs> no comment you know there'd be a, there's a record and a continuity of this is where the canopy has been and has moved to both in looking on the wider to communicate to the wider community and to provide stability and continuity yeah so i think we should do you want to put this on an uh an agenda as an agenda item at our next meeting to talk mm -hmm. about this okay all right. 
Um, we probably so early in September because yeah. it's it's um, you know it's pretty but like I know that you you submit it October one, but the packet is pretty significant uh, to have done in a month. You know, so yeah. I think can we I, give them more yeah. time and move quicker? I'm, I'm Do we need sorry. more people? I'm sorry, Jen. Just I'm sorry, Sue. I'm I, sorry. Sorry, Jen. Just finish your thought. I look at. Um, I would just suggest that at it next meeting we decide: Are we going to do it, and who's going to do it? You know. So the grant is, you know, the one page is okay, but I think a bulk of the grant, the information to fill out the packet, needs to be done in September. You know. Yeah. To because. It's not a lot of, it's not a ton of time, you know? Yep. And no, whoever is heading yep. that, whoever's going to head that up, um, I don't want to head it up. I'd be happy to help, but I I don't want to be the person who's right, just saying. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm happy to help, but it's not, I don't want to, you know, be doing the whole, you know, the primary person. So. Okay. All right. Let's so I'll, I'll put it on as an agenda item. Um, and the other thing too, is if we decide to, if we decide to ask uh, to, for another grant for, uh, I mean, sorry, another inventory by using the grant method, we have a framework to work from already, which is our existing framework that we have, but I just, my question would be, to, I'm going to, and in the interim, I'm going to email Davy Resource Group yeah. just to actually see if they could give me a ballpark. I, I have to make contact with our contact person there, retired. So I will need to figure out just so I have an idea of what it would cost. Given the fact that we already have a baseline data uh, set already. Right. But if anyone else, after looking, after looking at the information that Jen sent in an, in an email about the different types of grants that are available. If anyone else would like to think about any of the other grant opportunities, please feel free to bring your thoughts to the next meeting, please. Um, all right, uh, Rob, I we, we had a little um, fall planting discussion, but we tabled it because Jen told me you were gonna, you were gonna be able to join. So I, I just wanted to yeah. basically have an informal discussion about everyone's thoughts about the fall planting and where we are given um, the drought we're in right now. So well, I, I went along with Alicia yesterday, sorted about oh, 80 trees that are re ready to go where we already actually have the dig safes ready. They'd have to be renewed. And so I'm keeping an eye on that, um, you know, to renew them sometime in, in the next month, just in case it starts raining a lot, I guess. I mean, we would resume if it rained a whole bunch. I, I, I don't know. Um, but we are, we are ready. I mean, it's, there's a problem in that we have all these trees at Spring Grove that really are wanting to be planted. So, but I completely understand that putting more trees out now with the water trucks running just endangers the other existing trees. So that's, that's how, I, I mean, today, literally I was late, I was out looking at some of the trees and I see trees that are, well, I can see some trees that are 10 years old that have bags on them now, like the, the swamp white oak near the DPW. That looks awful. That's probably 10 years old. and. And I was down at the Gazette just when I realized I was supposed to be here and saw that um, Rich, your, your crew had put a bag on one uh, Nissa Sabbatica and now there are one or two more that need that. And so, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm, although we're, we're ready to plant, I think, um, I'd like to see the planting be very limited uh, if, if we're still having a drought. What do you is think? It, is it better to keep, like, I guess there's more than just what, you know, Rob was just talking about, but is, um, 
is the survival rate chance higher if they we keep them in pots in the nursery or if we get them in the ground? Do you know what I'm saying? Like you can't predict well, that. I, I'm pretty sure the survival rate will be good being kept in, in the nursery because they'll get water and they'll continue to grow, to live. But the root systems are overgrowing the bags. So well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So you'll end up with some very weird root systems. But I think, and this would be for Rich to weigh in on, I think that if when we go plant, we have a surgeon available for each tree. <laughs> which, I mean, in other words, not just hand them out, but hand them out after, after someone that's very skillful has gone over them. We can probably, I mean, it's a little like starting with a a B and B tree because you've cut off some of the some major roots in order to plant because some of those roots are becoming rather major that are now twisted around. And they'd have to be sawn off. That's that's. But you know, um, that's. Uh, I, I think the other thing is I'm a little allergic to putting trees out there that'll die in, in public sight. <laughs> uh, you know, we've made an effort. Uh, Jen, you and I in particular, to run around and pick up some of the dead trees. Um, and we we only got about halfway through when we stopped to go and do tree care. So we've been out, Jen and I and Christina and our uh, doing tree care and, and uh, which includes identifying trees that need water support and getting that to them. And that's been really effective. I, I see, uh, thank you, Rich, I see a lot of trees that we identified that you've got water to, and they're 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 good. So that's that's my take. Uh, there are a few projects that I think we have to do, like old school commons. That's right at uh, right downtown, across from the Academy of Music, and I think we should plant that anyway. Um, you know, sort of critical, hard won spots. Mm -hmm. uh, we should prob probably do anyway. And I think we need to plant Warfield Place. Oh, yeah, yeah right, for sure. I'm, I'm going to try to arrange uh, a meeting, which I will, I'll let you know when the meeting is, but I'm going to arrange a meeting with the residents on Warfield Place, probably in early September, to have a discussion about the tree planting. But that probably has to happen and hope, possibly, I might be able to get some of the residents to help water the trees. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a new couple that's moved in um, uh, next to um, um, Ruth and um, what is Oliver? It? Oliver, thank you. I couldn't remember. Yeah, a, a couple that's very interested in getting some trees planted. So there's uh, getting some good vibes from from folks, but it's just cool. a matter of I think it's just a matter of really prioritizing. If we're going to have limited planting, like Rob just said, we probably ought to prioritize the places. It would be easier to group the trees all together in a, in a place that way there the aftercare is a little easier. Um, and we also would probably try to um, plant places where we could get people to hopefully water the trees to help us a little bit. That's the other thing. So, Lead so school wants 20, I think. David's working with them. Yeah. Yeah, so I actually went to lead school and met the principal and they do want 20 trees, but they know that it's not going to be till next year. Good, 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 good. So and, Warfield. Yeah, Warfield, old school commons. So uh, Rich, when you, the, the whole issue of people watering the trees, because if people would water them, it's really not such a pr problem for right. putting out more trees. But my experience is, because I'll, I'll sign people up to water them and they'll agree to water them. And these are nice and responsible people. And then they get busy and then they don't water them. Right. It's really my experience. I'm, you know, I don't, I don't hold it against them, but I'm like, think, I sort of think like, in order to grow these trees, it has to be somebody's top priority. And when it, as soon as it becomes your fourth priority, that's kind of the end of it. Do you, do you think um, this just popped into my head that like, let's say on Warfield Place, for example, we signed five people up to help water. Do you think there could be a email push pushes or text pushes saying, 
hey, don't forget to fill up that bag. You know, like I'm not the person that could figure that out, but I do know uh, it could be, I mean, maybe that's just it. People don't, people who are not plant people don't kind of have that running. Like I know, you know, in my own property, like, oh yeah, this thing, you know, I just right. know it just comes up in my head you know right. oh yeah i noticed they don't they think they've watered and they've only given it like a gallon no. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> even or though two, or even three gallons and it's not watered so, right. so, so on this whole water issue um the, the, um christina is in touch with a group of people in northampton a group of 120 people who who are gardeners of one kind or another that are all associated with the synagogue and they live all over Northampton. And in theory, they're volunteering to become like a water brigade. And we might try and divide them up into zones. And, you know, we're early stage, we're working on it. And, and wow. Maybe, yeah, and maybe that will bear fruit. Hmm. You know, That's because, a huge project. Yeah, Christina is just um, beginning to talk with them. They have a map that shows where all the people live. It's not for public use obviously we don't want to show where they live but so we can see their ge geographical location and then if they live on streets that are of use and interest to us then we can identify them and potentially ask them to become like street captains for the watering on that street wow. i don't know you know we were thinking that they might then use wheelbarrows and buckets to cover the street and get people to help them mm. it, it, I, I kind of feel like we don't, I, we, I, you know, Tree Northampton, Rich, don't really have the right traction to get the population to water the trees. I know people have made those little, you know, little tags, this tree needs water. Mm -hmm. I think those are absolutely useless. I don't think anyone has ever watered a tree from reading one of those. You need to have somebody who takes responsibility for it, who says, I will do this. I will do Especially this. Especially yeah. if they're involved with other people, they can hold each other accountable. Yeah, exactly. And also, if it's no good for us, me, Tree Northampton, or you, I think, to do it tree by tree, person by person, there has to be like a, an organization of people who are responsible to each other and who are becoming like that's what they do. And yeah, there has to be like a people who really want to focus on it. I think it's possible. We'll see what Christina has to say. She's um, in touch right now. This, this just started, I think that we, we started communicating with them last week and it goes on this week. Hopefully something. So- um, Can we move on down the agenda? Cause we're running out of time. Yeah. yeah. So I just like Rich, your final comments on what you think will happen if it doesn't rain, what we should do and how we're gonna. I, I think if it doesn't rain, I think we will do some plantings, but they'll be limited. And Very limited. Places yeah. that we go, places that we plant, we are gonna have to saturate the ground yeah. prior to planting. You know, if we're gonna plant Warfield Place, we'll saturate all the planting locations the day before, just to right. get soil moisture in the ground. Um, because without that soil moisture, you're not really going to get any root growth of any kind, uh, yeah. you know, prior to winter. And then we're just going to end up with um, mortality from um, desiccation. Because yeah. there's, you know, the, the, the plant just can't transition. I, I don't know. I'm very perplexed at the moment. Um, I don't want to waste the plant material we have. Right. And I also don't want to put plant material out there that's not going to survive like rob mentioned already it, it looks it looks pretty bad it's right. it's sort of like a lot of the tree canopy we have we have a lot of beautiful mature trees but we just don't have the resources to take care of them so you know i'd rather hold off until we get some real rain and hopefully we'll get some rain but i think we we need to probably have this discussion at our next meeting or you know at least a little sidebar of this to see where we're at Okay, one positive note is that this, the, the, the hours of daylight are a little lower right now and it, and it has cooled off a little and it is just incredible how well most of the trees are doing. The, the young trees, they're just amazing to me. I mean, I see trees 
planted in 2019 that are not getting water support and they're green and these are dying. So it's amazing. And Thanks Jen's for the positive. Me. Yeah, it, really amazing. I mean, so what happens is we have 10 good trees and then one dying, you know, but, but that's, you know, given the drought, the, the depth of the drought, I think that it's partly we've planted the right species and uh, they, they, I mean, it's the sweet gums and the Kentucky coffee trees and the um, tomatosa lindens are all just many of them looking good. Many. All right. All right. Um, so we have uh, two things on the agenda that are left future UFC meetings and guest speakers. I left that on there because I, um, I wanted to talk about um, our maybe getting some guest speakers, but I, I kind of already covered that in the beginning of the meeting a little bit. So I don't know if you, anyone has any thoughts on that, but I, in September, we'll go back to the two meeting month format like we discussed, and then we'll just keep moving along. And um, if any of you have any thoughts about a guest speaker that you'd like to hear or have at one of the meetings out of the month, please let me know, send me an email. Um, if you would like to be the guest speaker, please do so. You can do be a guest speaker. Um, I'm gonna try to get Alex Sherman to come to our next meeting in September. So we'll get to listen to uh, um, his experience with spider lantern fly. Yeah, good. Um, and then Sue will, um, Sue will actually talk with uh, the Amherst Tree folks to see if they are willing to do a joint meeting that has some educational component to it. Or what date sooner. would that be? I, I don't know. I think, I think okay. you need, you need, I don't know when their meetings are, Sue. So you would have to figure out how that would work because they are, they have a meeting time frame like we do that stays pretty consistent. So we would probably have to, they would have to acquiesce to our time frame or they would have to, we would have to go into their time. Date. I was thinking they'd acquiesce to ours and just be just a heads up public meeting. Okay. All Sign right. in if you want to learn about this. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So, so you'll, you and I will communicate about this. Um, outside of this meeting. Uh, spotted lantern fly. Okay, so I sent all of you an email today from uh, Tani Samiski. I don't know if you had a chance to read it. No, I have not. You have not, okay. I can't, I can't do a screen share because- Oh, uh, I can. All right, so let me make, because I do a screen share. Yeah. My computer, yep. the way it's connected right now is gonna go, let me see, make co-host. Yes. Okay, you are now a co-host. Okay, let's see. It's uh, pretty, it's helpful. There we go. Okay, perfect. All right, so this is the email from Tawny today. Um, MDAR says, it's about a land Spotted lanternfly is detected at any location in Massachusetts. Her recommendation is always to report it to MDAR, which is the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture Resources. Uh, MDAR will then be in touch with you to confirm this, any suspicious findings and then respond individually uh, as appropriate. This is what they've done in Springfield. And I was wanting to know uh, what, Al, um, what Alex's experience was after, because he was meeting with MDAR, I believe, the beginning of this week. Um, they would survey the location uh, to determine how widespread the infestation is and working with local fish officials such as the tree warden or other commissioners um, would identify the next steps. But, the, uh, but really the one response you need to uh, have planned or prepared um, at first that I know of is just to report it. So um, she's not directly involved in MDARS decision-making, although they are great at keeping me updated about what's going on. She see, she see, see Astra Perkins who leads the MDAR spotted lanternfly response survey and Jennifer Forthman Orth as well. Possibly it might be, I might reach out to either one of these folks and see if they would be a guest speaker at a meeting. That might be helpful. Um, additionally, MDAR uh, is hosting a webinar this morning, which I didn't go, I didn't listen to, but you could actually probably take this link and actually find it and because it's being recorded. 
Um, and um, other than that, that was really about it. But I thought it was helpful at least to have a, a place to go to. It doesn't seem to me that Spotted Lanternfly is um, on the same playing field as the uh, Asian Longhorn Beetle or even um, as on the same playing as Emerald Ash Borer in regards to the response. Because remember, we had Emerald Ash Borer, we had the state was quarantined in different, um, you know, Berkshire County, Hampshire County, Franklin County, until the whole state was inf infested and then they dropped it all. But it doesn't seem to me, it just seems to me that it's basically a monitoring. Uh, once you find it, you have to report it and then MDAR takes the lead. But what that lead is, I don't know. And I'm sorry, I don't have any more <laughs> answers for you. So I think it would be good to get one of these folks to come to one of our meetings if they're willing. So I, I can reach out to either one of them. Yeah, it would be great to be able to ask them those questions. Well, what what is the actual plan? Yeah. What do you do once we notify you? Then what? Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, try clicking on that link and see if, if you can actually um, get on that webinar. It's, I'm sure it's probably archived somewhere. Yeah. I don't see it yet. No, you. You clicked on it. It takes you to the mass to just introduce pest outreach blog, and it mentions there's webinars quarterly, 10 a.m. to 11:10 on May 18, August 17, November 16, February 15. This is all spotted lanternfly. Mm -hmm. So today's there's one from May is archived. Yeah, maybe it's not maybe it's not posted on the archive yet. Yeah, they so probably in a few will. days. This one will be archived presumably, or when they can do it. Yeah. Um, are are you, some of you at the last meeting said that you would be available to do some Atlanta surveys? <laughs> that's still the case because I could if you tell me I'll show you the map of what needs to be done and you can tell me which one you want and I can send it maps and the forms to you um so I'm going to share again um this one oh I think I think Jen and I we're going to team up and do a, do an area okay so here's a map of um downtown Northampton divided into segments um, let's see, to give you an idea, let me add the, the road names. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Hopefully it won't crowd them all in there. The red dots are where we have found it already. Okay, that gives you an idea. Hmm. This is, um, yeah, this is, oh, here's, um, I think this is Main Street here. Um, this is the industrial park. This is like, oh, I'm going to finish this section. Um, this is the backside of Ward 3. Um, this is, oh, 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 oh. That's round. Oh, I see where we are. This is Route 9 here. That's, that's Elm Street. You're, yeah, this is Round, round Hill Road. Um, I don't have a number here, but this is Rob's neighborhood. Yep. Um, this is Smith Vocational. So um, any preferences? Here's like South Street. No, I mean, I don't I don't have a preference like, other than if you want to give us a block that we can kind of connect the dots. Yeah. You know, like Crescent Street area, Round Hill area would be fine. I don't know, Jen, you want to do some walking? Yeah, that's fine. But okay. Yeah, that, right. that, that'd work. Okay, I'll give you this one here. Molly, well, remind me when you crush the leaf, it does smell like it's oh, it, it smells like burnt peanut butter. Okay. Because <laughs> I found what I thought was Ilanthus and I crushed the leaf and it turned out, I think, to be sumac. It's a very strong smell. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, I um, remember. You're telling me, and I and I did smell it once, and I kind of forgot. Yeah. So the things that you might confuse it for are um, 
sumac, black walnut, and even sometimes black cherry, because sometimes those leaves can look like compound leaves oh, okay. um, from a distance. But you should bring binoculars um, and also um, look for, you know, because sometimes you can't reach the leaves. Uh, you know, if it's high up, you want to look at the leaves through the binoculars. And if they're, if they have teeth all around the edges of the leaves, it's black walnut or sumac. Yeah. Um, but the other thing you can look at, if it's big enough, you can look at the bark. And the bark of black walnut and ailanthus is totally different. The ailanthus is smooth and gray. Yeah. Black walnut is furrowed. Yeah. So do you want to do one too, Rob? Well, I wander around a lot, and so I, 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 I suspect I'll find some. And but then... I want to know, we need to know like which areas have been covered. So it's helpful to like cover yeah. a certain zone. Well, I can cover my neighborhood where it, um, um, this is one that here. Zone? Is that a zone of some kind? Yeah, let me zoom in on that. But it, it's not. I know, I didn't give it a number. I have to give it a number. Let's see. Yeah, this is Smith College. Yep. Yeah. That's your neighborhood there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and this is yeah, this is Smith College over here. I'll separate. That's separate. Yeah, I probably won't actually do Smith College. Eh? Okay. Probably I'll give you this much. one, and I'll give Jen yeah. and Rich this one over here. That would be great. Yeah. The time I went out, the ones we saw were like squished against like a building or garage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where they're likely to be is like in un tended hedgerows like say between driveways yeah or um fence lines yeah fence lines um yeah. next to like a, a garage or something that's not tended but there are a few that are actually trees in people's yards so you have to look right. in people's backyards and so when you go down the street you're trying to look not just along the street but especially behind the houses beside them as much as you can because we want to cover like say that this whole area is done, including between the houses. Yeah. But, wear but your you, tree vest. You, you have to wear your vest and kind of, you can't go wander into their backyard. But you no, no. But with, that's where the binoculars come in handy too. Right. But if they're around, you can ask them if you can see their backyard. Right. Sure. Yeah. But then you have to talk to them and that takes yeah, a long usually, time. Yeah, usually I don't bother with that. Molly, I found one um, that I'll send you. Uh, a uh, coordinates on it's at Bridge Street Cemetery. Oh, okay. one of the garages that abut um, Orchard Street. So okay, I'll I'll send you a, a location via text message. Okay, so you're gonna have it, and that way you can come down and look at it, or you can just add it to the map. Yeah, I'll add it to the map. Okay. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. All right. Oh, so, so, Paul, did you say you're gonna? You, you'll. You're I'll gonna, send you. I will send you the papers or the either electronically or um, yeah, I guess I'll just send it electronically, the forms well, and the map. That'd be good. That'd be good. And Sue, did you want to do one? Um, or I we still could, don't feel very confident in my ability to not d distinguish them. We could join up and do one together. Okay. Um, I'm in the neighborhood. Well, tell me what neighborhood, Molly. I'm and I will make, I will work around you. Well, let's, let's just contact each other and we'll set a date. Okay. It doesn't really matter where we do. All right. Molly, Molly, you'll send Jen and I the form. Yep. All yep. Right, perfect. Yep. All right. And Jen and I will connect and make some time to go for. Great. Exercise. Great. Um, Great. Any, anything else, Molly? Um, no, I'm just curious to know what, um, what we're going to find out next month. Yes. Hopefully I'll have either Alex Sherman will come to a meeting or I will get one of those folks from uh, MDAR. Maybe we'll come uh, to just kind of give us a little lowdown from their own experience. Mm -hmm. um, any other business not anticipated by the chair? Anyone have anything they want to bring up? No. Okay. Um, I would just like to say, Deb, can you turn your camera on for a second? <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. I just want to make sure you guys are still there and not sleeping. We didn't sleep. I know, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> we had side conversations about trees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. I, I just wanted to say uh, to Deb, thank you, Deb. Um, oh, no. For, yeah, for, thank you. For doing a great, a great job, job. And sort of kind of like 
shepherding us through all the different changes that have yeah. happened at DPW. <laughs> um, There's been a lot. And, and you've done a fantastic job and I appreciate all your hard work and effort to keep pace with us. Well, thank you guys. I learned a lot from you. I really appreciate everybody's volunteering and interests and advice. I think uh, anybody watching one of the meetings um, just has something to gain, which is a nice thing. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And, and Bonnie, are you sure you want to do this now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I'm going to give it a shot. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Thank you for stepping up. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, does anyone have anything else that they'd like to bring up before we call for a motion? To so what's our, our next meeting is when? Oh, let me look at the calendar. Hold on. Sorry. Um, I want to say thank you for to Jackie for coming to our meetings. Yeah. September 7th. Maybe September 7th, that'd yes. be the first. September 7th would be our next, the first uh, Wednesday of September. 7th and then the 21st, right? Yes. Yep. That really puts it in perspective for the grant applicant, the uh, intent to apply. So yeah. Good. Okay. All right, Any, anything, anything from anyone else? All right. Could I have a motion to adjourn, please? Motion to adjourn. I have a second. Rob seconds the motion to adjourn. All right, motion is made and seconded. And any discussion on the floor? All those in favor, raise their hands. All right, thank you, everyone. It's been wonderful thank to you. see you all. Thank Bye. you, Rich. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Take care.